University of Florida in 2001. So, um, and I've been back, uh, gosh, when was the last time I was back here? Sometime in the 2000s. Um, so it's been a minute since I've been back on campus and in the area. And um, when I was here, I spent a lot of time at the Purple Porpoise. Um, I was not doing internships, okay. <laughs> so I commend you guys for being so engaged in your studies. Closed? No, purple porpoise. Well, it became the social, and now it's now it's McDinton's. Yes. A few weeks ago. And from what I understand, the Irish bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> from what I understand, that building's gonna turn into towers. Really? Yeah. I oh. got uh, somebody sent me a link. To Building was purchased by a developer, and they're going to turn it into something, you know, apartment, apartments or something. Um, and so when Deborah and I were talking about, I actually met my husband here too. Deborah and I were talking about uh, parking on campus, and she was, you know, giving me the rundown about the the um, police being adamant about parking, and it brought up a memory that. My husband once on campus got a uh, speeding ticket while on a bike <laughs> on campus here. And the irony about it was that he was going to pick up a friend who was too drunk to drive. So. Sorry, you just pick him up on the bike? On the bike, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we did back then. All right, all right. Um, Get on the back of my bike. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, right. So anyway. Uh, here, being invited here, y'all bringing out this spread for me is, is really a nice treat, and it's an honor to be back in my old stomping grounds. Um, and of course, it's an honor to be part of preserving the legacy of uh, Florida history and working with UF Archives and the Oral History Department. So, um, we started Preserve South back in 2018. Um, we actually formed after the closure of a previous company that I worked for. So I've known Flo now for 15? Yeah, about 15 years probably. Um, before and, Preserve South. Before, yeah, before Preserve South. So I, uh, my team and I were with a company called Crawford Media Services, and we had a division that was focused on digitizing legacy media. So film, video, audio collections. Um, but Mr. Crawford decided to close the business in 2017, and we were um, very committed to the work that we were doing and committed to doing it in the South. And so we decided to open up a company called Preserve South, which is what you see. Um, at that time, Burt Jones owned a company called Back Porch Broadcast, which he still does. And he so he approached me about starting up this line of work, and we did. I mean, within a couple months, we had business in the door. We, One of our first accounts actually was running the court TV collection, which we're still running. Um, 100,000 hours of courtroom footage that we started with the O.J. Simpson case. <laughs> and it's like, that's one way to start a company. Um, but Back Porch, what's interesting about Back Porch Broadcast is that they repair all of these old machines that it takes to keep these um, formats running. So all of the old, you know, beta decks, VHS decks, cassette decks, all of that, they make sure that all of those machines are up and running. Um, so Deborah brought out a couple boxes. So I'll give you a little kind of rundown of formats and then I'll kind of dive into what we're, what we're facing. So, I don't know if y'all have ever seen these. We can pass them around, but these are DAT tapes, digital audio tapes. Um, they were professional use. You wouldn't see them in your home, right? Um, they were mostly used for either professional music recordings or, you know, in this case, audio oral histories, um, interviews. So we come across quite a bit of these, and they can be pretty tough these days to run back. Um, and then 
This is a newer-ish format. These are mini discs, which come with their own set of issues. Um, these were more consumer-based. You would find you could find a mini disc recorder, you know, back then mm -hmm. at Sears. <laughs> Do you need any? I still have one. Oh, yeah? <laughs> hey, we'll take it. And Deborah, here's the hard drive in this Oh, thank you. Box. Thank you. Um, and then for you, you youngins, you youngins who never made a mixtape, um, these are audio cassettes. So audio cassettes were both uh, they were mostly consumer based, but they were used for a lot of purposes, including oral histories. Um, and, if, you know, if you've heard of, I'm sure you've all heard of a mixtape, this is what a mixtape actually was. Originally. <laughs> an artifact. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I know that y'all, in the working in the field, coming across archive, archival content, you may come across formats that you don't know. There are so many, and there. I have been doing this for 15 years and still come across um, formats that I've never heard of before. You know, just weird adoptions that made short runs. And uh, so the message there is, if you're adopting technology, stick with mainstream. Because if you go with something that's a little esoteric or you know state of the art, it might not last that long. We deal with, as I mentioned. Uh, moving image film, so 16, 8, 35 millimeter film. There's a lot of other like 9.5, 28 international formats that you probably would never see in your lifetime. Um, all of the wide world of audio tape formats and then videotape formats galore. Um, one of the issues that, and this is what I really wanted to talk to you guys about, one of the issues that we're coming across these days is just the ability to play them back. So I'm going to move over to, is that spreadsheet? Oh, it's the keep going. Oh, there there you go. Okay. Um, so we worked on this Jewish studies collection recently, and Deborah mentioned that there were a couple tapes in here that were challenging to play back, that Deborah was unable to get to play back without a lot of squeaking. And so she kind of felt that they were lost, but wanted to see what we could do with them. And sure enough, we were able to play them back, but not without some pretty significant intervention. And it turned out they, they had issues that were uh, not issues that we see often, but we're starting to see more of. So what our audio engineer wrote was felt guide had loose on media, re-adhered guide, and ingested successfully. So essentially just glued, if you, if that cassette tape is still making it way around. Um, yeah, that just guides the magnetic strip along. Yeah, don't Yeah, don't get mayo on it. Um, so like right here, on a cassette, there's like this little felt pad that kind of like cleans the tape as it rotates. And yeah. So it helps kind of create an anti-static environment, stabilizes the tape pad, as Flo mentioned, kind of brushes it clean a little bit along the way. Um, and then he writes, media suffers from significant soft binder syndrome. So normally we have um, uh, something called sticky shed or binder hydrolysis. Um, this is soft binder syndrome, which is loss of lubrication, causing abnormal stiction during playback. So stiction, again, is... So with magnet magnetic media, um, over time... Uh, and also due to the formulation of the tapes, that oxide that's on the plastic backing can start to flake away, right? Um, so typically what we do is um, the moisture gets in between that, that plastic and the magnetic oxide. So typically what we would do is we would put them in ovens. We have, um, we have professional grade, low temperature, food dehydrators, it's really what they are, uh, here they are, 
And we bake them. We bake the uh, tapes at like 136 degrees, some somewhere between 120 and 136. Depending on the tape size, that kind of determines how long that the tapes stay in, in addition to um, just how bad the sticky shed is. So we'll bake them. It leaches the moisture out and rebinds the oxide to the plastic backing to enable us to play um, the tape back. That's what we normally see. But this Does it is run the tape, Emily, when that is the baking process? Or it just literally sits there rolled up yeah. and bakes? Okay. Yeah, it, it sits there and then we let it cool. Right. And then we'll we'll give it another try and play it back. And oftentimes we're successful. Sometimes some formats we have to bake for like three weeks in order to get any kind of signal to rebind. Um, so that's what stiction is, abnormal stiction during playback. Carrier did not respond to multiple incubation attempts. That's baking. So we tried to bake it several times and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Safely applied D5 siloxane, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, to carrier. So, and I actually had to look this up myself, but siloxane is like a, it's used in hair, like hair conditioner. Mm -hmm. It's a lubricant. It's like a softener. And applying it just um, lubricates that tape pack just enough to be able to play it back. Mm -hmm. um, and once we did that, we, we actually, in this case, had to apply it during a slow wind. So flow, this would be a scenario where we had to wind it and apply the lubricant all through the wind. Um, we were able to play it back and, uh, and it was success. So uh, <clears throat> our audio engineer wanted me to say that this is completely safe. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> there's no environmental hazard using this chemical, but after we digitized it, we go back through and we remove it. So it's oh. no longer in the tape pack. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we don't see a lot of. And I don't know um, if that is due to the tape format. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's due to the manufacturer mm -hmm. um, or the age. There are a lot of variables involved. My mm -hmm. sense is, because we've seen a lot of issues with some um, audio cassette uh, manufacturers that are kind of odd. They're not mainstream. Like, so this was uh, a dictation cassette, SM, Studio Magnetics, like just an off brand. Like, mm -hmm. typically with audio cassettes, you would see Sony or Maxell. Uh, those were some of the bigger brands. This was kind of a smaller brand. Jay I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if. It was the brand itself that caused that kind of oddball issue or or what. But <clears throat> needless to say, we were able to save the content and um, hooray, but it's getting harder and harder. Flo? I was going to say, like, there's a similar thing in the archives world where you have, you do interventions, but you make sure they're reversible. Yeah. And that's what Emily was talking mm -hmm. about there with that tape. Um, you put something mm -hmm. in an enclosure, but you don't seal it. You put it in an L sleeve mm -hmm. so that it can be pulled out right. to be digitized mm -hmm. or preserved. And it's just sure. like the static electricity that holds it in that in that binder for the for the same reason that you do things that don't don't change the original integrity of the of the item you're trying to preserve. Yeah, and the interesting thing about these materials is that you need a third, you need a, a carrier in order to listen to it, to view it. So there's a lot of discussion about, are we saving the content? Or are we saving the item, right? In a couple years, these will all just be paperweights. They will not be of value because you won't be able to get any content off of them anymore. Um, so really, with these materials, it's a little, aside from film, because film, as long as there's a light source and the film is stable, you'll always be able to play back film. Uh, but with the magnetic media, it's, it's more challenging. 
And there are three reasons why. One is condition, which we kind of talked about here, and we'll go into more. Um, the second one is the carriers themselves. So the mm. machines that we need to play these materials mm. back are no longer manufactured, um, and they're also getting older. And then three is the engineers, <laughs> sadly, mm. who know how to fix the machines are also getting older <laughs> and crankier. <laughs> and so, um, so we've got we've got a lot working against us in order pre to preserve this content. Um, as I mentioned, I've been in this field for 15 years about, and for the last 12 years, I would say, we have been saying that um, there was 10 years left. So we probably hit that particular um, mark in the map two, two years ago. And what's interesting about that is while we didn't necessarily fall off a cliff, which I had thought, you know, these things are just going to stop working. We're not going to be able to play them back. Instead, we're coming across more issues. It's more challenging than ever to uh, play these materials back. We're having to use more intervention measures. The tape baking that we're having to do has increased so I used to work in 20% of VHS tapes, for instance, needed to be baked. Now 100% of them need to be baked. Um, pneumatics automatically get baked. Um, there's one format in particular that I would give another year on, which is a half inch open reel. I don't know if you guys have any of those. They were oddly adopted in a lot of like art programs and um, so we did a project for University of South Carolina and it was, they had a couple hundred of these half inch open reel tapes and they were all of these like art thesis projects, right? So I don't know what salesperson went in in the 60s and 70s and sold this format to all of these different art programs, but that seems to be where I find them in like theater departments and uh, music departments at universities. Um, we we also are about to start work on a project for Spelman College. Um, they were recently awarded a clear grant to digitize their college archives, and they have a tremendous amount of this format, half-inch open reel. We did a pilot project for them to help kind of build momentum and interest around their collection using one tape, one half inch open reel tape. And um, we, we were able to digitize it after baking it for a very long time. And we were able to get the content off of it. It was black and white. Well, what was interesting about that is then one of the um, women that works in the archives just did a Google search for this particular content. It was a 1976 lock-in of the trustees it was a really pivotal point in Spelman history. And she found the video on YouTube and it was in color. And I don't yet know, I have my suspicions. I don't know if the half inch open reel tape that they had was maybe a transfer from film and it was transferred in black and white, which could be a possibility, but more likely what the scenario is, is that so much of that signal has already been lost that the color is now gone and it's now playing back in black and white. And so my suspicion is, is that now we are at the end of life for that format. I mean, there's only a couple machines that exist to begin with. There's only a couple people who know how to repair those machines and the tape itself is not doing us any favors. So the same is true for two inch quad, um, which I know Boyd is sending me back with. He's got a couple of those in this collection. It's another format. Now those were widely adopted uh, once the video uh, tapes came on the market. They were the broadcast format for PBS. They were the broadcast format for every station across the country. So there's a lot more support, and actually when we play them back, they still look beautiful. The problem there is that the heads on those machines are no longer produced. And the people who know how to repair those machines and create the heads 
are no longer around. And so there's only a certain number of head life left mm -hmm. in order to play back the content that we have to play back with that format. So we're up against another um, hurdle with those, which I might give those maybe another five years before we don't see quad machines around anymore or heads mm -hmm. made for the quad machines anymore. Um, some of these other mainstream formats like audio cassettes and pneumatics, they've got a few more years left on them, but it's not getting any easier. Um, but again, I go to the point that these engineers are also very old. There's not a lot of people who want to get into a career that's a dying industry, right? <laughs> it's not a good, like, you know, long-term strategy. And so getting young people who are interested in, uh, you know, working on boards and soldering components, you just don't find people who have that interest anymore. And so um, the, the outlook for those other um, magnetic media is maybe five more years. Like it, we don't have a lot of time left to save this content. And um, it's really tragic because you know, the decision makers don't understand the not only the value of the content that we're trying to preserve, but the time that we have remaining to get it done. Um, so for a while, what was really fun, I say that sarcastically, um, was that optical media was used as a storage device. So CDs, DVDs, <clears throat> Sony went around trying to sell like these gold discs that would last a hundred years. Um, <laughs> we are now seeing more issues with optical discs across the board than we are with magnetic media. And so playing back CDs and DVDs are increasingly more challenging and more concerning with just, just loss, you know, and, um, uh, it doesn't really bode well for prioritizing content, although I'll say that a lot of the materials that are stored on uh, CDs and DVDs probably originated from some magnetic media source. So it's helpful to know what your original copy is. Um, and then you just have condition, right? So storage conditions. I'm sure that when you've collected, Flo, I know you've collected... Uh, assets from locations that are unspeakable. <laughs> uh, there have been quite a few university athletic collections that have been known to store their materials in the top floor of their stadiums. Um, there have been some really priceless collections that have been stored in basements that have flooded. Um, you look at any collection, any collection that I price out that's from Louisiana, I go ahead and build in like mold remediation and mm -hmm. tape baking for everything because we know that even if they have best intentions, the storage conditions are suspect. So the environment that we're storing these materials in is also an issue. Um, I mentioned with film, if it's stored well, then it'll last forever, but that also comes with challenges because storing film well is in a freezer. And most people don't have film freezers. So you'll start to see issues like vinegar syndrome uh, and warping of the film. I've seen some film reels that have degraded so badly they look like oatmeal cookies. <laughs> um, it's wild. Just like they're in metal cans, right? So the cans will rust and the film will warp and it just it just steamrolls in its little can and turns into a hockey puck mess. Um, so storing of the, of these materials is also incredibly important for long-term preservation. Um, so we've got a lot working against us, but luckily there are some funding resources. Um, I know last year, uh, UF was successful in getting a clear grant for the Burning Spear collection, which just wrapped up, which is great. Um, but there's probably tenfold materials than 
uh, budget in order to get things done. So prioritization is incredibly important, making sure that uh, you know, you're making decisions not just based on the format obsolescence, but also on the content itself in order to preserve it. So I know that was a lot and heavy and depressing, um, but do you guys have any questions? I'm wondering if you can tell us one of your greatest rescue stories where you had a tape or some form of media that you were like, oh, I don't really have high hopes. Well, this was a really good one. I will say this really was yes. a, a good one. Um, so did that migrate to another format? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, we were able to digitize it to WAV files. So they're on this hard drive now. Uh, this hard drive, actually. Let me make sure that all stays together. Um, yeah, so that was a good story. Um, let me think. We, it, we It's been interesting over the years um, seeing how the variation with how people care for their collection. So we've been doing a lot of work with Austin City Limits over the years. We've finished their video collection. If you're not familiar with Austin City Limits, it's the longest running uh, music show out of Austin, KLRU. Uh, started as country music, but now it's kind of evolved into all sorts of genres, um, and it's still on air. <clears throat> Their very first episode was Willie Nelson, and they actually carried that original quad tape with them, that's how much it meant to them, on a plane when they came to visit, because they didn't want to ship it through regular means. Um, we have some people who mm -hmm. ship materials using fine art handlers, and we have some people who just send us a used box and by the time it gets to us it's like dented up and tapes are falling out so it's really kind of interesting to see the level of care and concern uh, that goes with handling these materials um, everything from hand holding it to loose boxes but um, yeah that this probably is one of our greatest success stories in getting something to play back wow <laughs> At least in Thank recent, you. I'd have to think, I'd have to, I'd have to ask around and see if anybody has any other stories. We, um, there, we had a couple projects, one that we just did for the University of Hawaii. Um, they wanted to reassemble a film and they had three elements to it. They had, um, the, uh, original print, they had the A and B roles, which, Back then, you would have an A roll and a B roll, and then they would be joined together, edited together, and make your print. Um, and then we had an audio roll, and the audio roll was too far gone for us to use. The print was too far gone for us to use, but the print had an audio track on it that was still viable. So we used that for the audio track, and then we used the A and B rolls for the video track the mm -hmm. um and then we sunk them all together mm -hmm. and they are releasing it at their film festival mm -hmm. in a couple months so there's a lot of projects that are wow. kind of <clears throat> frankenstein-ish a little bit um yeah. but yeah yes I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, one is, what is the most modern form of recording technology that you've had to work with that's like starting to give problems? Yeah. Well, I, I, again, the optical discs are probably the most um, uh, modern in terms of like a one-to-one -one ratio. There are some storage data storage devices that were used that are also now becoming obsolete. Um, jazz drives, like there's a lot of, there's a whole nother line of like data storage devices that are now antiquated that we're seeing a lot of that are giving us trouble. Um, so those probably in terms of being more modern as in they probably came out in the 2000s are giving us trouble just because nobody manufactures those drives anymore to play them back uh, or to to uh, get the content off of those. 
Um, but right now, luckily, like HD cam tapes, which is probably the last mm. version of a videotape that was ever released, they're still pretty stable. Um, beta, beta SP, Digi Beta, those all came before HD cam came out. But the earliest versions of beta and beta cam are starting to really give us trouble. So, um, yeah, in ter terms of modernity, I would say it was those data formats that are a little wacky. Yeah. Um, do you, I haven't had a chance to visit your website yet. Do you, is, is there something on your website or have you come across it where it has like a graphic, like a picture of the recording material and then what sort of machine is used to read it so that like if I was out thrifting or something like if I found something I'm like oh they don't produce this anymore this might be valuable for like if you have a scrapyard or something right course. yeah well we don't we don't have that on our website but I have started putting together a format guide so at least folks can start identifying a little easier what they have in their collection um and knowing what kind of problems might present themselves um in terms of the machines you know, it's a little tricky because there were professional machines and then there were consumer machines. And so when we're looking at playing back the materials, we definitely want to stick to the professional machines because the consumer machines can often be cheap and just not get a good signal on playback, um, which I don't know that you would find those thrifting necessarily. There's a lot on eBay, um, but it's a good thought to put something together like that. Um, especially identif identifying which like serial, no not serial numbers, but which model numbers mm -hmm. of those machines would be beneficial to pick up. Yeah, just as they become more scarce. Yeah. Like what, what can we salvage? So, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you were in here for the beginning, but our sister company is Back Porch Broadcast. Mm -hmm. And they refurbish, they repair equipment, um, they help source decks. So they're constantly scouring um eBay for machines and when news stations go or purge whatever they have they'll I mean there's been dumpster diving for equipment like there's yeah they're always mm. on the lookout for equipment any other questions I wonder if anybody here or um, knows of as a humanities educator I don't really I don't get into the technical side as much, but I'm wondering if there's somebody here on campus that teaches history of technology, or if you can just do an adjunct semester yeah, and, yeah. and teach all of the know. UF students all of these different formats and yeah. you know approaches to them. Because sure. to me, it's just like, oh, well, just get the can content off of this yeah. and put it on something that I can use in my teaching, right? Right. But um, but there's so many, you know, the there's double in the detail with so all these many. technical. And we didn't even talk about records. Um, yeah. So <laughs> records are a whole nother kind of format that there's so much variation. Mm -hmm. There's so many different substrates of material that you were used to create the records from aluminum to what we know as vinyl. Um, cardboard has been used, which to... To, my husband's the audio engineer. To me, the fact that you can record an audio signal on a piece of cardboard is just like mind blowing. But um, the fortunate thing about records is, again, if they are stored well, those will last a pretty long time. Um, but again, the storage of those is, is suspect, right? So we want to make sure that they're in decent condition. But as long as there's a needle, they can be played back. Uh, just like with the film, as long as there's a light source, <laughs> which hopefully we'll have uh, for many hundreds of years to come, uh, we'll always be able to watch film as long as it's stored well. I have some questions. First of all, I, this might be just outside of expertise here, but what what are your hopes or like prognosis for all these digital storage formats that we have. Does that feel like a safer bet in the long run than this all this physical media? 
Yeah. Uh, again, I, you know, I urge anyone who's looking at store data storage to go with something mainstream. Don't, you know, go with some state of the art mm -hmm. format that might be on the scene for six months and then disappear. You want to go with something that's had a track run and has a roadmap future. So, um, there's, there's, uh, what is it? The digital preservation, um, uh, I forget the the organization, but they have a whole uh, map of how to store data effectively. So they they recommend storing in three different locations on three different media types, which would ensure that if there was a solar flare, you know your LTO tapes won't get destroyed, or if there's a huge you know, disruption to Amazon servers, you'll still have access to your media locally. Um, so, and even within the three different locations, they suggest three different geographical regions. So if one's prone to flooding and one's prone to tornadoes, <laughs> you know, you have your bases covered there. But the reality is, is who can afford that, right? <laughs> so uh, that's, that's the issue that a lot of institutions are faced with is how do we do this economically and effectively and making decisions about file types and uh, data sizes and things like that come into play um, because you want to you want to preserve the content but you also want to make sure that it's uh, got a long-term success so if you're doing a project, you know, I've been on some projects that are a couple petabytes of data. Um, mm. The storage ramifications of that over the long term are probably more than the cost mm. to digitize the media in the first place. Mm. So uh, a, a sound preservation plan includes uh, having some sort of backup and also cost effective measures over the long run. I, I would also wonder how we should decide to prioritize what we have to do. I, I get the sense we might have more to digitize than it would be possible to actually get done. Yeah. So how, how would you go about making that decision for like a giant like that? Yeah. Um, well, it, you know, it's twofold. And you, you've got to look at the formats um, and see which of those formats are facing obsolescence the quickest. And then you kind of compare that with content. So which content is the most priceless in your archive, the most valuable? Um, you can determine that in a couple different ways, whether it's user value, you know, is this monetizable? Is it content that you can, uh, that will be of high interest or is it content that is most valuable to the organization? Um, there's a, you know, those are, internal questions that need to be answered, but looking at both of those and seeing where those priorities match up, I think is probably the best way to approach it. Yeah, we look at, we do that, make those decisions all the time with archives, right? With, mm -hmm. with <clears throat> what is interest to the researchers that are current, the, re the incoming scholars, what are their interests? So those materials get prioritized. Are you a brand new professor fresh from a PhD at Cornell and you're looking at this particular area and we have stuff in obsolete formats that you could use to create, to create scholarship or to teach with your students, et cetera. So those kinds of uh, decisions are, you know, you have, to, you have to be an expert in your field and know what's out there and talk to your faculty. Mm -hmm. Etc. To to find to discern those to make those you know those decisions. Yeah, what's been really nice is the grant funds that have been available to do this sort of work have really lifted up voices that have mm -hmm. often been kind of relegated to the shadows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're there. There are a lot more projects being funded that are focused on like LGBTQ history or uh, African American history or women's history where it used to obviously be very WASPy centered. So it's nice to see that 
we're kind of evening the playing field about what gets preserved. Um, it's also interesting to me seeing the projects that do move quickly and projects that don't move quickly. Um, corporate archives um, end up getting funded to be digitized and then collections that you would want to, you know, general public collections that you'd want to preserve are, can be a little bit harder to get uh, to get saved. So, you know, I mean, history will kind of tell that story about what content got preserved and what didn't. Yeah. Um, so when Ms. Dever and I were visiting, I think it was in, in one room, they had like the Billy Graham yeah. like televangelist oh. archive, and then in the other room, the Uhuru, like African Socialist People's Party yeah. ar archives, both from the 70s, just like going at the same time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and it's been interesting too. So the Billy Graham archive, I mean, I had been talking to them for like 10 years, and they finally were able to get a plan together and get funding and get that project rolling. At the same time, the King Center was finally, after 10 years of discussions, able to get that project funding, funded and get it rolling. And it turned out in discussions with both of them that Billy Graham had a very warm relationship with Coretta Scott King. And so my hope was that at some point in these archives, we would find out some sort of connection that proved that relationship, because so far it hasn't been found in any kind of written documentation. Wow. But I don't think we've come across anything like that yet. But it would be interesting to, to find those connections across history. Um, and, and that's why, again, grant writers are so important in, in our work. It's not like I have expertise in it, but if you yeah. can get a really good grant writer that knows who's funding what kind of project and what the priorities are, they can spin it. Yes. to get you the funding. Yeah, yeah like the ATOM funding that y'all had to mm -hmm. digitize all of the, the ATOM collection that you had here, mm -hmm. that was really significant and important mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. save those materials. Yeah. That was the um, Doris Duke. Association mm -hmm. of Tribal... Yeah. I'm not sure. Do you remember the acronym? Archives and Museums? Ar something? Archives, Libraries, and Museums, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, finding where those pockets of money are and then being able to go after them is incredibly important. And unfortunately, a lot of these projects that we see are funded with external sources. So, um, it, you know, it's a hustle to get them funded, but the payoff is great. Like Spelman College, for instance, they receive very little funding to support their library from the college itself everything that they fund their library with is either through research requests or um, through grant funding. And so um, it's really great that they've been able to get this award and they have an application in for a second one and we have our fingers crossed. So it's a struggle. I wish I, if I won the lottery, I would <laughs> have some digitization endowment, but digitization apprenticeship that sounds like it's yeah exactly yeah. exactly exactly yeah and that's one of the biggest struggles so you know I mentioned the engineers are getting older and they are uh, they're the engineers that we have working uh, at back porch and on our machines were all Sony uh, bench techs in their previous life and now they're working on all of these machines but they're all 60 plus. Right, so they're nearing retirement, they're having hip replacements, they're having knee replacements, they're having heart attacks, like, you know, there's, and there's so much work for them to do that there's not a lot of time for an apprenticeship. So it really would take someone funding that in particular to dedicate time and resources to be able to have some sort of training program. But again, it's, you know, who, who wants to pursue that as a career track? Well, there really are so many different jobs. I mean, these mm -hmm. students are like oral historians. Yeah. But you have you have instruction people. You have grant writers. That's a skill that yeah. I don't have that I totally admire in people like program directors. Yeah. 
and people to sign off on such things and to endorse them. Yeah. Uh, you know, to say this is relevant for me and my research, that all of those items, you know, all of those jobs, all yeah. of those verbs that that happen to make this work and your all your technical people, your engineers, etc. These people want they want benefits. They want a pension. Right. You know, they want health care. They want right. you know they, we need all those we things. We need all those right? things. And so um, yeah, they can have apprentices that are maybe like working on an hourly yeah wage, but but not the sixty plus year olds that that are like the you know the brain trust yeah. of these different technical yeah. uh, formats. Yeah, and I mentioned to you all, I graduated from UF. I graduated with a degree in English and a focus in film and media studies. I had this idea in my head that I would become a film director. Um, my film theory class was with Scott Nygren, who, if any of y'all remember him, um, he's since passed, but um, he was great. And he essentially gave us a camera. It was a mini DV camera, and he gave us a Final Cut Pro edit system mm -hmm. and said, I want you to make documentaries based on using archival materials. And it was the first time I'd ever even, like, really heard that term used. It was very introductory. Um, through that, I found the Vanderbilt Television uh, News Archive, which has, um, if you all haven't looked at the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, it's really incredible. Mm. They recorded, they were like the Internet Archive before the Internet mm. Archive was a thing. So they recorded news broadcasts going back to like the 60s um, and still do. And um, anyway, so I made my first documentaries in his class. And at the time, I had no clue that this was a, a, a career path. I, I did become a uh, producer for a little bit, but fell into the archives world kind of uh, by chance, and I love it. It's great. Have you visited the Scott Nygren studio in Library West? No! We're going. Oh, we're going. We're totally going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of classroom, a lot of, a lot of classes taught in there, and uh, it's really cool. Oh, I love that. Right there on the entry level of library west i love that yeah yeah that's really neat um any other questions have you thought about beyond digitization also do because right now ai you will yeah. use it so much we can continue on do some metadata yeah because <laughs> that's what we're doing with uh burning spear yeah. We got oh, yeah. material and we'll work on the metadata. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, Chelsea is trying using AI to get the transcript. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we'll re reach the metadata. But the basic metadata actually is also from you guys' spreadsheet. That's great. Are you, uh, what tools are you using for AI? Um, Chelsea is testing Echolab. Okay. Yeah, to get the transcript. Now, I was just suggesting her we can. From the transcript, we can get even more metadata. Yep. But right now, we're getting the titles from you guys' spreadsheet. Yep. And the date, and some notes. Yep. But then, if with transcript, for example, if it's to say a chair, a chairman speaks, then we will try to find who is this chairman. Yeah. So yeah. that's great. Um, there, over the last fifteen years, there's been tremendous progress on that front with AI metadata. Um, there's another program called Whisper AI that I know is being used and incorporated into a lot of other tools. It's open source, but if you're if you know your way around open source tools, that you might find that useful as well. Um, it's also become a lot more accurate. Obviously, dialects are always going to be an issue, but um, but yeah, the tools on that front are getting a lot more sophisticated. Um, so that's great. I'd love to know how that all goes. Um, I think FSU and Emory are also working on a, a project kind of proofing out some use of AI tools using Whisper AI, potentially. I'll check it out. Yeah, I feel like, didn't they present on that at the SFA like meeting? FSU last? libraries? Yeah, hmm. last year. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Were you there at FSU? 
At FSU, no, no, you weren't there. Was SFA last year, okay. Yeah. No, I was at the most recent right. one. Right. Yeah, this was at the. the F no, I wasn't. Twenty twenty three. I was on sabbatical last year. That's right. That's right. Um, so yeah, so there's some pretty cool tools on that front, um, and then of course the digital preservation side of the world will always be evolving. We talk about migration. Digitization is one component of it, but migrating from all of these different data sources to another, um, you know, the videotape world, the video file world has been evolving constantly. Luckily, the audio world has stayed very stable. They made a decision to go with WAV files. It's always been WAV files. It'll always be WAV files. That's fantastic. The video and film world is a whole different beast mm. with lots of different esoteric file mm -hmm. formats. And so migrating not just from one file format to the next to keep it relevant. Yeah. Uh, like, what was that? Word perfect? Like, nobody uses word perfect anymore. <laughs> right? My master's thesis is in word perfect. And you've got to, <laughs> if you're going to save it, you've got to migrate it to a, it a doc. <laughs> uh, yeah. So not just making sure that you're staying on top of uh, migrating the, the file format itself, but also the digital storage devices mm -hmm. and making sure that they're always relatively up to date mm -hmm. <laughs> and accessible. Um, the cloud certainly is a good backup. I wouldn't, you know, yeah. they're all privately owned. So I don't know if I would rely on it solely as my only source of backup. You always want to have something localized if you can to keep it uh, under your control. Right. The cloud isn't the cloud. The cloud is just somebody else's computer. That's the true. <laughs> That's right. A lot of them. It's not a real cloud. It's a big <laughs> data farm. Big. And, you know, uh, it, this is not an environmentally friendly line no. of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these materials can't really be recycled. They're all going to end up in a dumpster one day. It's sad. There's some pieces of mm -hmm. tapes that can be recycled that have, you know, the, mag the mm -hmm. metal components. But for the most part, mm -hmm. it's a lot of plastic waste. Mm -hmm. There's been a, a lot of um, experimental use of like worms that eat plastic, you know, to try to reduce landfill but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of plastic going out and there's a lot of data coming in and the data centers are not uh, environmentally friendly either but it's the price we pay to preserve uh, our history right so we can all go cry now yeah I know <laughs> sorry <laughs> I think I need an Oreo. How about yes. <laughs> That's why there are cookies. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was great.